To start out with, I'll give you a little information here before we start the slideshows. Uh, I started going when a friend of mine drug me to a caving meeting when I was in college. Well, I, I didn't know about all of this, but that weekend they had a trip planned, so I went with them. And, oh, was that miserable. Long trip. Well, three hours, 45 minutes. Couldn't hardly move for the next two weeks. And I figured that's, that's enough of that. Well, after about three weeks, you know, the pain goes away. Some of the guys are going again. And wonder what's around that other corner. What area we didn't get to? What's in there to see? And the next thing you know, you're going again and again and again. And finally, it grew into a, you might say, a lifetime hobby here. So to go in caves, which uh, the majority of everything you'll see tonight is mostly what you call wild caves. They're not the commercial caves that you pay to go through, so there's no lights or nothing in there. And I like to stress a little bit, we don't have any young people here. I do this for, well, like 4-H or scouts and that, but we try to stress anyway that uh, anyone goes in, you stress conservation and safety and all of this. And in caves, to go in caves, it's always good. To, that number three always comes to mind. If you're going in a cave, a minimum of three people together. Uh, all these years, I've never had, been in a situation where anybody ever got hurt, but he could. So the thing is, if you go in a cave and you got three people, if someone gets injured, the person could stay with that person, the other person go for help. The other thing is, if you're in the cave, you also want to carry three sources of light. And as I said, three people, no, that doesn't mean you, you, and you. That means each person has three complete individual sources of light. My, for years, my main source was always the carbide lamp. So, well, I didn't bring my hard hat in tonight, but it's got the LED lights now and things of that nature. Uh, I still like the carbide lamp. It gives a better lighting, I think, more even lighting, better color and all. And uh, the carbide lamp, not only did I bring it to mention what I used for light well, most of the years, this is the size. So when you see the pictures, the carbide lamp gives you scale in a lot of pictures, give you an idea of the size of what you're looking at. The carbide lamp, if you're not familiar with it, now you're wondering about my hip flask here. <laughs> my hip flask will rattle. It has a double cap on it. That way, you don't have to worry about water getting into your carbide. You'll fit right in the hip pocket, carry your carbide. And this container will carry about a 20-hour supply of carbide. You put some carbide in the base of the lamp, water in the top. When you turn the valve on, it water will drip into the carbide, and that gives off acetylene gas, the same as what you have uh, doing uh, welding in that. And then you can adjust your, the speed of the drip is the amount of gas that you get out, and you can adjust your flame here. One filling of this here in most of the Missouri areas, due to humidity and all, is a two and a half, two and three quarter hour supply. That's how long it'll run before you have to change your carbide and run out. Uh, for backup lights, well, I usually carry a small flashlight. Uh, there's some, can some matches in this container, and then a candle in my ammo box that, with my camera equipment. This also carries a dry felt that filters the gas. It has a spare tip in case this one blows out. That's a safety feature then on the lamp. If pressure gets too high, you'll blow it out. So there's spare ones of that. There's a little reamer in here to clean the tip, and you might say, this is your life support when you're underground. So you want to take care of it. And the carbide lamp, you can abuse it quite a bit. And it still gives you light. Photography has always been a hobby of mine. And mostly, I still like flash bulbs. As you can see in my basement, I all supply of flash bulbs. But uh, I brought one along. It's a little M3 bulb here. And you will see that 
in some pictures to give you the size of the pictures. Uh, some of the bulbs that we use underground are about like a, well, they'll go up to like a 100 watt light bulb or a 150 watt light bulb, large bulbs, which are awkward to carry in the cave because it takes a lot of volume to pack them all in and that and to carry it. But that gives you a bro brief overview of what to look for and in the pictures. So we, uh, we'll try to get the lights down and uh, we'll start out with, this is a, just a general nice picture, some formations. The picture there is an area about somewhere about eight feet tall, about like a room in a house to give you the size. As we we're going into the cave, you notice size, you know. That's very important that you realize, you know, the scale of what you're looking at. And right away, you're already confused. <laughs> because what you just saw in the previous photo was about a six inch tall doll. <laughs> so that picture really is only about three feet tall there, small area. So scale is a very important thing here. That's actual size. That's an actual person. And actually, he had went through that the first time. This was Virgin Passage when he went through it. And he backed back into it on the way out again just to get a picture. So you, you have all sizes in the caves. This is Blanchard Springs Caverns down in north central Arkansas. If ever down in that area, I would encourage you to go see it. It's uh, run by the National Forest Service. Uh, but in contrast, their ceiling height in some of the areas runs 80, 90 feet in height. That's uh, when they were doing the construction work prior to when it was open to the public is when these were taken. So where do you find the caves? Typically on the hillside is where you'll find them. And right in this area, you can see in the limestone rock, small outcropping of rock there. And a little closer view, it would look something like this. Some of the openings are there nice, level, flat to go in. That one's, you can see there, it's probably eight, 10 foot opening here. It may be in a bluff. This is Cave Spring down in the current river in Missouri. There's room in there to get a couple of canoes in there and turn around. But the first step out of the boat to the bottom of that is 126 feet down. So there's quite a volume of water coming out of this spring. It could be a pit where you need ropes to go in. This one is also, it's in Arkansas. And makes a lot of people wonder, yes, it's out in the woods. There's no fence. There's nothing around it. And you do have to watch, especially coon hunters going out. But... Uh, this one is about 180 feet to the bottom. Or it may be a large opening on a river bluff for a person for scale. This is Cave in Rock over in Illinois. It could be a small opening under the bluff where you have to literally squeeze or crawl in. People ask me, what about snakes? Uh, you know, copperheads and rattlesnakes, they like that area, you know. So definitely watch where you're going, you know. But the thing is, the good thing about the snakes, they only go back about as far as daylight. So once you get in the cave, you'll never see any snakes farther back. Remember that thought. You might be on a bluff overlooking the river or something to where the only excess may be use of ropes coming in from up above. Another type of cave, it's... It is a cave, but it's full of water, and that's a spring. This happens to be Blue Spring, also in Missouri, and uh, divers go in, and they, there are some of the caves over there, they'll go down as much as 200 feet in depth and three, four miles back into these springs, and they are doing mapping and surveying and all that back in the they actually take reserve air tanks in and station them. And 
to see where they go in. This is blue spring. There's the bubbles from the diver going down. And if anybody's interested in going to one of these, I'll be glad to take you. And if you want to go in there, I'm going to be sitting right here on this rock waiting for you to come out. That's, I haven't lost anything in those springs. Another type cave is one that's under a glacier. Now this is up in the mountains where a glacier, as they would say, a dead glacier, or one that's no longer moving. If it's a live glacier moving, then you don't want to even get near the face of them because the rock's coming out of them and that. But they're solid all the way down. This glacier, and it's Mount Rainier National Park in the state of Washington, the glacier is in the valley. It no longer moved, so the snow melt above ran to the bottom of the valley and comes out under the glacier. This glacier is melted way back now, but when I was there, you could actually travel back about a mile in the, under this sheet of ice. And this water here is what you call liquid ice. Very cold out there. Another type cave is one that's formed in lava areas. It's when the lava comes down a slope, the hot lava, molten lava, runs down the slope, and then as it slows down, it cools. So what happens? You get a crust on top of that lava flow that gets cool and hard, but the molten lava hot underneath keeps flowing and leaves a passage under that crust. There's a carbide lamp for scale in that picture. There's a lot of those lava caves will be in, especially in Hawaii. That's basically all lava flows. So the best thing to do here is to go in a cave. Let's just take a trip. We'll take a hypothetical trip, something that you would not see in, all the things you'll see would not occur in one type of cave. So the idea is, when you want to go, the hot part of summer or the cold part of winter, because in the spring and fall, it's too nice outside to do other things outdoors. So you go when it's miserable outside. And if you go in the winter, if you can't get the vehicle through, take enough people and carry it through, you know. And uh, don't party too much the night before. <laughs> 